stuff, you know? I'll do, yeah, I'll do anything that helps. Welcome. It's n wonderful to see such a good, uh, a good um, turnout for a, such an important project. Um, I wanted you all to be aware that this is our first time on videotaping um, our, our presentation. Uh, we've been trying to do that for a while, and uh, we um, hope this is going to work out. The, um, this will be on YouTube. We'll send out an information and with maybe a link um, later on. So the people that couldn't make it today will still be able to get that information. As you all know, that's the main goal for the League is to educate the public. So we want to make sure that as many people can he hear this information as possible. So with that said, let me um, move on. Today um, we have four wonderful speakers. By the way, we were trying to get a conference call organized. We usually do that before the uh, luncheon so the speakers can coordinate. These people are so busy right now to try to coordinate that. It's amazing that they were able to make time for us today. So um, as I'm sure they'll, they'll share their, their um, time. is very precious right now. So we're going to start with um, Dr. Ed, Ev Mead. He's the director of Transborder Institute at the University of San Diego. He holds a BA and PhD in history and an MA in social sciences from the University of Chicago. Dr. Mead's research explores the history and theory of human rights with geographic focus on Mexico and Central America. Most recently, he edited and translated a collection of 31 first-hand accounts of the violence of the drug war in Sinaloa and is documenting the experience of refugees from the hemisphere drug war who sought safe haven in the United States. For the past 15 years, Dr. Mead has been a volunteer at the National Immigrant Justice Center in Chicago, which coordinates the largest network of pro bono immigration attorneys in the country. And he recently joined the advisory board of the American Bar Association's Immigrant Justice Project in San Diego. He serves as an expert witness in asylum cases and teaches courses at USD. So join me in welcoming Dr. Ed Mead. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the, the, the warm introduction. Let me just say it's, a, it's, it's, it's fantastic to be here with the League of Women Voters because of the history and trajectory of the organization, but much more specifically here in San Diego. The League has taken a leading role really over the last three or four years, and I want to signal Beryl Flom for her incredible efforts in this regard. You know, raising the, this, this question of, are we really paying attention to detention and deportation? So thank you all very much for that effort. It's something I follow closely, and I've been very uh, honored to, to take part in. I want to talk about two things today. There, we, we're, we have great speakers, and I don't want to rob any time from anybody else. So I want to do two things. One, I want to talk about what's going on in the border from a big macro perspective. Talk about some numbers and handle this question of, is the border really in crisis, or if it is, in what ways is it in crisis or not in crisis, and what does that mean? And then I want to just tell you uh, a couple of stories that hint at the range of things that people are fleeing in Central America and Mexico right now, and really put the challenge on us as to how are we going to handle that uh, from the perspective of humanitarian action, from the perspective of human rights, and from the broader perspective of what do we want our country to mean? Um, you know, what's, what's our legacy going to be? So the first part, let's talk about some numbers. Um, you've probably heard uh, people say two things lately. You've heard the President of the United States talk about there being a crisis on the border, declaring a national emergency, uh, using this kind of language. And in fact, for the last two years, we've had a constant barrage of that. You may have also heard some of the responses to that. And the most typical, the, the most oft-cited number is the fact that Apprehension, so the number of people who are trying to get into the United States who are not authorized to come here is hovering around a 40-year low. And so how do you square that? How do we square the fact that we're, we, we're declaring a crisis on the one hand, and yet the center of that crisis, people trying to get here who are not authorized to get here, is at a 40-year low? And let me just add to that. If you put that into context, this, this year, for 2018, just shy of 400,000 people were apprehended trying to get into the United States. That's one quarter 
of where we were in the year 2000. It was 1.6 million. And let me take that just a little bit deeper. Let me take that just a little bit deeper. If you go back to the year 2000, most of those people who were apprehended were trying to get away from the people who were trying to apprehend them. They were running from the Border Patrol, trying to abscond, trying to get into the United States. And I'm not trying to portray them as a danger, but this is just a basic fact. Now, the vast majority of people who are apprehended surrender to the Border Patrol. And in fact, many of them are looking for them. And it's a relatively orderly process. So not only is the number lower, but the phenomenon itself is lower. So then you hear an, another set of numbers. You hope hear people talking about uh, the border being overwhelmed by asylum seekers. Let's consider that for a second. Well, if you look from 2013 to 2018, the number of asylum seekers in the United States has gone up dramatically. That's true. It's gone up by about 100,000. 2013, it was about 42,000. In this two, the past year, it was 142,000. That's real. And most of those folks, a large percentage of those folks, are coming from the Northern Triangle countries of Central America. So they're coming from Guatemala, from El Salvador, and from Honduras. These are the people who are in this, the, the most recent caravan of about 6,000 people who arrived in Tijuana. So what does that mean? Well, if you listen to the administration, the administration will tell you this is exactly why the big number doesn't matter because these folks, we can't just turn around. They have these inconvenient things called rights. <laughs> they, they have, they're entitled to an interview under U.S. law and the opportunity to apply for asylum if, in fact, they're, they're, they have a well-founded fear of persecution. There's that but there's that other piece, too, which, again, they're turning themselves in. So we don't want to mischaracterize that. So we have to ask ourselves, what, what's going on on the border? What does this mean? And let, let, me take, let me tell you that the only piece of this where you know, I would concede that we might talk about something that where we could use some kind of language of crisis is the humanitarian conditions that these folks face. Um, you know, I spent uh, less time than some of my colleagues here but every day from the arrival of the caravan for about the next five weeks, I was in Tijuana visiting people uh, in shelters there, particularly El Barretal. We kind of staked out a little restaurant around the corner, and we're doing asylum screenings and coordinating different kinds of humanitarian and legal aid to people. And the conditions were abysmal. I mean, this was a refugee camp, a refugee camp. It was not a migrant shelter. It had all the aspects of a refugee camp, soldiers out front, Right? They were issuing uh, digital IDs by the end as to who could come in and, 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 and who couldn't. Uh, the rationing of food. Uh, it was, this was a refugee camp right here. And it's a new kind of refugee camp. It's a refugee camp in an era where you can be in contact with somebody there on your phone through WhatsApp or text messages. And that's incredible to sit in your living room in San Diego and be talking to someone who's in a refugee camp. A stone's throw away. So let's talk about those asylum seekers for just a second. So what's happened with asylum over the last couple of years? We have more applicants, and we have a different presidential administration, to say the least. Um, one of the things that's happened seems mathematically impossible. The grant rate for asylum seekers has gone up, but so has the denial rate. And this is particularly true for asylum seekers from Mexico and Central America. And you say, Professor, that does not make sense. Well, it only makes sense if you think about there being two options for asylum seekers. They either get asylum or they're denied asylum. But in practice, really over the last 15 years or the last 20 years, we have had other ways. The courts have had other ways of disposing of asylum cases. And it turns out, for example, if you look at the Mexican cases, a majority of cases under the Obama administration were administratively closed or somehow they were given uh, prosecutorial discretion such that they were granted relief so they weren't deported, but they were not granted asylum. <laughs> Under the present administration, that's all but disappeared. In the first year of the Trump administration, I don't think they knew that the category existed, frankly. Um, but in the second year, uh, under Jeff Sessions, um, they basically got rid of this whole category of relief. So the result is this contradictory reality. The denial rate has gone up. But so is the grant rate, and the grant rate going up is really important, too. Because even in an immigration system that's controlled almost exclusively by the executive branch in the United States, where there's very little review, when you hear from an immigration judge, you're not hearing somebody from someone who's part of the judiciary. They're part of the executive branch. They're in the chain of command right there to the attorney general and the president. Even in that administration, the grant rate has gone up. Why? Because the quality of cases has gone up. Because the people who are fleeing 
El Salvador or Guatemala or Honduras, and to a certain degree Mexico, are presenting quality cases. They're showing that indeed they have a well-founded fear of persecution and they cannot return. So let me talk very briefly uh, about some of these cases. Um, one, I, I would think, and I think the practitioners here can, can hopefully back me up on this and maybe give you some, some more specifics, but I think one of the biggest challenges of these asylum seekers that we see right now from Central America, their cases are so diverse. We have people fleeing forced re recruitment into gangs. We have people who are fleeing the extortion of their businesses from multiple groups at the same time. So that one group says, oh, you're in the pocket of the other group and I'm targeting you for that. We have people who are fleeing classic political persecution. I interviewed a group of about a dozen people who are fleeing Nicaragua right now. And they're fleeing because they were jailed for protesting or, or showing solidarity with protesters. I interviewed one man who is a, a contractor, a construction contractor with the government, and he fled because he refused to build a torture chamber for the government to house those prisoners. Um, but these are, and this is an incredibly diverse range of claims. We have people who are fleeing extreme forms of domestic violence. Um, and this, by the way, is, is important evidence for one of the, com the common uh, ways in which we um, denigrate asylum seekers, or, or at least certain folks do uh, among, in our policymaking community. They say that they're speaking from a script. Right? There's no script. Let me tell you, if you spend a week talking to different people, you will hear a hundred different stories. There's no script. And when you interview people repeatedly, no one could stick to a script even if there had been one in the first place. Right? It just has that, what, what Theodore Roosevelt called, that tang of truth. It's just there. It's too inconvenient not to be the case. So let me talk to you just about, uh, let me just finish here with, with, with two specific cases, and these both come from uh, caravan members. So uh, one of the families I'm uh, working with, and it also gets at the problem with finding that truth, right? If you're, in a, asylum, if you're doing an asylum screening and you have a half an hour with someone, just think about that to get their story. If you, a total stranger comes up to you, and says, and, 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 and you say, you know, I, I'm looking for an asylum screening, and let's say it's based on uh, extreme domestic violence. You're going to sit down at a table with somebody in a semi-public place and say, okay, let's talk about the time I was raped. It's that, it's, this is what happens. It's really imperfect. Uh, the whole system, the whole way of handling human beings this way is dehumanizing. So you have to think about that and take these things with a grain of salt because we only have a tiny window on these things and often very pressed for time and pressed for volunteers. So let me tell you two stories. So the first is a, a family from Honduras, uh, and they, uh, they came, there's five members of the family, um, uh, a married couple and, uh, with a three-year-old son and a cousin. First big problem for them, if they cross the border, they're going to be separated as a family. Or at least there was a strong threat of it. And you know, if they separate dad, it doesn't count as family separation. Let me just point that out for you. And all the controversy we had this summer about the separation of families, the dads don't count. I'm a dad with two little kids. We should count. Right? Now, more recently they've been letting whole family units, they've been bonding them out together, but there's no policies that, that says that they must do that. So the second problem was the cousin. The cousin's a member of the family, but he doesn't count as a member of the family under law. So even if they bond the family out as a family unit and they have a GPS ankle monitor, the cousin will be detained and separated. Um, that was the first thing. So why were they fleeing? They were fleeing because um, in the area, the, the, for, for two reasons, and this is one of the most complicated things with these family cases, it's not just one thing. In the area in which they live, the cousin and the dad had been targeted by the local landowner who's collaborating with drug traffickers because they refused to work for the drug traffickers. They just wanted to pick coffee. But the wife has a different claim. She's in that town and married to this guy because he helped her get away from really serious gang violence in Santa Drusula. And it's a horrible story. Uh, I sat down with her and, and I started to ask her if she could give me some examples of the violence. And she recounted for me in straight detail, like kind of with an eye lock on me for about three hours, case after case after case. Assassinations, the mutilation of bodies, gory recruitment rituals. I mean, it, it, you, it was things that you could not make up. That's one case, and it's a complicated case, because does it apply to the whole family? Who adjudicates this case? And their case also tells us something else. They had one of these numbers to wait in line, you know, and their number was in the 1600s. 
And um, a couple of people advised them, look, you'll, you'll probably be able, your number will probably come up sometime in January. Well, they fled before Christmas, and they decided to walk through a hole in the fence. Okay, so there, there are some of these ones who, these folks who came looking to do this all the legal way, and they didn't do that in the end. They made a decision that it was unsafe to be in Tijuana, not coincidentally two days after 200 teenagers were murdered in Tijuana. That affected them. But they made this decision to come across that way. The place where they came across was a hole in the fence just east of Tijuana. It, the hole was lit up by a spotlight by the Border Patrol. And they walked through the hole with their hands up. And they actually passed their three-year-old son over a boulder to the Border Patrol agent. That's really important because that just counts as one more tick there, one more apprehension. Or in their cases, it's a four members of the family, so four more ticks. But they were not trying to sneak into the United States. They were trying to apply for asylum. Uh, and they had no desire of uh, getting around U.S. authorities. Let me tell you just w one other story that, um, again, uh, gets at the, the layers and complications here. So one of the families that we were working with, um, actually the very first night that we went to El Baretel, right after people had been moved there after a rainstorm, I was with my students and we witnessed a, a horrible traffic accident where a man and, 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 and a woman were together and they were hit by a truck by a drunk driver and knocked down, and the woman was on the sidewalk. We couldn't see the man, actually. We just we heard the noise, and the lights in the place we were at across the street went out, so the power went out because he hit a telephone pole. And we, we ran over to attend to the woman. There happened to be a hospital on the corner. Didn't have an emergency room, but some nurses came out and treated the woman. And then one of my um, staff people was, was with me, Chris Burgos, who's from Tijuana, and she walked around the other side of the truck, and she could see that there was a man pinned to the telephone pole. And she started yelling to all of us, you know, help, 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 help. And we got together, about 10 of us, and picked up the front of the pickup truck, and he fell out, and he died. And I'm not telling you this to be lured. I'm telling you this because I promised his family wherever I went, I would tell their story, okay? I want to tell you that, too. I have their consent. In fact, they asked me to tell it. Now, we didn't know that they were migrants. We didn't know that they were part of the caravan at the time. But the police showed up, and there was a huge police presence and homicide detective. And I finally, and we were there, and we were sort of trapped in this little family restaurant. They were super nice to us across the street, but we didn't feel like we could leave because we felt like we were witnesses. And I finally talked to the detective, and I said, what's the deal? Why is this not just a traffic accident? And he said, well, there, there's something else going on here. And I, and I thought it was because of who the driver was. Maybe the driver had killed someone. I said, was the driver a gangster? And he said, yeah, look at him. Well, the driver had run away, and people from the neighborhood had captured him and brought him back. They didn't treat him very well either. I'm not going to tell you what the police did to him in front of us either. Um, but I thought it was about that. And then we found out from T1 News later on that these were members of the caravan. We found the woman later. And this is where it tells you, the you get into the complexity of their story. We went to interview her at El Baretal. We just felt a connection to her. Find out what she needs. Um, she had, a, had it up around her head. And we started talking to her. First of all, she didn't feel comfortable being out in the street. This is a street where she'd just seen someone killed. We interviewed her, and, and, and this was her story. She said to me, she said, you know, um, it wasn't her husband who was killed. That was falsely reported. It was a cousin who was traveling with her. They were a group of, of, of four that came from El Salvador together. They had fled because her, their family business had been targeted by local gangsters, and they come made the journey up through three countries to Mexico. And they got to Tijuana, and the first day, one of the cousins had a relative who promised them work. So he went to work, and on the job site that day, uh, a 30-foot wall of dirt fell on him and killed him. They then went for a walk to process the news, and this car hit the other cousin and sent her to the hospital. Okay, so it's a terrible combination of events, but it, you know, what does it have to do with them being, being migrants? or you know, what, What's the relevance of the story? Well, here's where this comes up. She was taken to the hospital. She was given an x-ray and treated, but when she first talked to who we think was a doctor, it could have been a hospital administrator, I'm not really sure, he said, well, who are you? And, and, and she explained where she came from and that she was a migrant, and the hospital administrator said, you don't belong here. And they sent her home without a Tylenol. I mean, with nothing. She, they gave her, she had a prescription, but no way to fill it. Um, and this is a person who had a serious head wound. I'm sure she had a concussion. She was knocked out for a while. Um, and they just, you know, wrapped a bandage around her head, and the Mexican migration authorities came up with a, with a wheelchair for her, but it came from them, not from the hospital. And that was her experience. And later, when the, dry, the drunk driver was, um, 
released on bail the same day she, they, they came, his family came looking for her to make sure she wouldn't file charges against them to threaten her. And she was then put in a protective custody. So what I want to say about that is you have the original thing they're fleeing, gangsters in El Salvador. You have the harrowing journey through Mexico. But then this happens and it tells you that it's not that Tijuana is bad or that everyone in Tijuana is against the migrants. There are actually far more people, I think, in Tijuana who are welcoming to migrants than those who are not. But it is a very complicated and at times hostile environment um, to the point where someone who really should just be treated as a victim or as a survivor uh, is someone that we basically have to put in protective custody um, and file a human rights claim on her behalf. But we have to think about that because there's what people are fleeing and then what people go through on the journey to get here. And for many people, the journey is just as bad. It adds another layer to this. So I'll leave this to the practitioners to talk about those issues, but thank you very much. Well, I didn't, didn't think about telling people to bring Kleenex with them. <laughs> Um, so our next speaker is um, Esmeralda Flores. Um, Esmeralda conducts extensive outreach in Mexico for the San Diego ACLU's Lopez Vegas Venegas versus Johnson settlement that challenged government policy on voluntary returns. For the past four years before joining the ACLU, she has worked as a staff attorney with the Binational Defense and Advocacy Program housed at the Casa del Min Migrante in Tijuana, Mexico. Her focus was on the documentation of human and civil rights violations and family separation issues due to deportations. In 2013, she presented a friend of the court brief before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. She's a graduate of the Universidad Autonoma de Baja California School of Law. She's also completed a postgraduate international migration program at the prestigious Colegio, Colegio de la Frontera Norte in Tijuana, which is the place we, are on our border tour, we visited the, that, uh, that college. So welcome, Esmeralda. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so my name is Esmeralda Flores. I work at the ACLU of San Diego uh, currently, but I'm here mostly to talk about the San Diego Rapper Response Network, which is a coalition of over 40 organizations here in San Diego um, that came together uh, almost two years ago. Um, so about after the election, uh, what happened, there was a lot of fear in our communities. Uh, we started seeing that a lot of folks were posting on social media, um, images of border patrol outside of swap meets, of markets, of schools. Uh, but some of those uh, posts weren't real. Uh, we started to notice that people were posting pictures of patrol cars that border patrol hasn't used in years. So this was just people trying to scare our undocumented and our immigrant community um, here locally. So after that, and many calls that a lot of organizations um, got um, the ACLU along with uh, multiple partners here in San Diego. We convened a meeting um, in 2017 um, to create a rapid response network uh, that other cities already had. So the idea was to create this network where people could denounce any immigration activity in their communities or harassment or checkpoints or immigration detentions of family members or loved ones. Um, so after a year of a lot of research um, and getting together with our partners and figuring out resources and capacity, uh, in December of 2017, we were able to launch the San Diego Rapid Response um, Network. So that's how the network was created. Um, and throughout our first year or six months, I think we received more than a thousand calls to report immigration activity in our communities. Uh, most of the activity that's uh, reported, it's false. Um, it's false, or sometimes, you know, Border Patrol takes a lunch too, so sometimes they just stop and buy food and leave, and doesn't mean they're actually doing any enforcement in our communities. But it's really important that we have the ability to respond to those um, concerns. So the way the San Diego Rapid Response Network works is basically <clears throat> we have a 24-hour hotline uh, where people can call. 
and it's a mostly volunteer um, based run. Uh, we have a lot of volunteers. We have dispatchers who are bilingual who answer the hotline. Um, they'll get basic information and then they'll dispatch our responders um, who will then go and verify, try, try to verify the activity that was reported to us. If we find out that there was um, activity or that someone was detained, then we'll try to connect uh, with the family and then refer them to our services. We are really lucky here in San Diego because we have a Jewish Family Service, which actually provides legal assessments um, to the families that are affected by immigration uh, enforcement in our, in our communities. Um, and that's something that not a lot of the, of the rapid response networks throughout California or other states have. Most of them, they just react to what's happening and try to alert the community to avoid any more um, detention, uh, but we do have the capacity to offer those services. So that was our first year, but then a lot of changes happened and a lot of politics and policies um, have affected San Diego. Uh, one of the things that we also had to work on was Operation Streamline. Has anyone, anybody heard of, of Operation Streamline? Yes, our volunteers mainly. <laughs> <laughs> so Operation Streamline, it's not, a new, it's not a new program. It has been in place in Texas and Arizona for many, many years, over 10 years. Uh, but California and San Diego had always managed to not implement it. So it's basically um, just, a, it's just a program where folks who are detained trying to cross the border between the ports of entry by Border Patrol are put in criminal proceedings. Um, so they'll be detained, let's say some, a group was detained last night, um, they'll be sent to a Border Patrol station, they'll wait there, um, they usually uh, by the next morning, they would have to go to criminal court and um, meet their attorney uh, and talk to the consulate if they have time, and then decide if whether or not if they want to plead guilty to a federal criminal charge of um, illegal entry to the country in a matter of like two hours. Um, so we were really lucky here in San Diego because the federal defenders were really active and vocal about their opposition and their concerns about the process of the, of the people going through the system. Um, it, has, it was implemented in the summer of last year, um, but currently, thanks to the Bell Project, uh, we also created a, a Operation Streamline Core Watch programs where volunteers, where volunteers would go and observe proceedings, and they were able to see folks um, you, when you go to these proceedings, you can hear actually the chains coming out of their, their feet and their hands before they enter the court. Um, some of them have the same clothes that they had throughout their journey. They didn't get to shower. They didn't get to sleep. They didn't get to eat. Um, and they'll just be sitting there uh, with their headphones trying to hear what the interpreter is saying looking at an attorney they just met like an hour ago and trying to decide whether or not they have to plead um, guilty. Right now, um, the process looks a little bit different. We don't have any more uh, same-day pleas, and we know that numbers of people who have gone through Operation Streamline have also uh, been going down, uh, it seems, in the last uh, couple of months. Um, the other thing that happened, that happened in the summer, and then late, um, in the beginning of November, um, the uh, immigration agencies stopped the safe release program. So the safe release program is just basically a policy that immigration agencies had where before releasing someone, they would make sure um, they were able to contact their family members and they had, any, and they had travel arrangements ready so they can um, move to their final destination within the U.S. and with the sponsor, especially for asylum-seeking uh, people. Um, so they stopped doing that, so they started just releasing families uh, at all hours of the day, um, mostly at the Greyhound Station in downtown. So the San Diego Rapid Response Network uh, received a call on a Friday night um, that there were families that seemed to be lost and that didn't speak any English, and some of them didn't even speak any Spanish. Um, so we activated the hotline, volunteers were able to respond, um, and we, take, we took them in into a church locally, and then after that, basically the San Diego response, the San, Di the San Diego Rapid Response Network had to um, create like an emergency shelter that has been uh, running 24-7 um, since then. Um, so that happened in the last 
In the first uh, 12 weeks of the shelter being implemented, we moved five times the location of the shelter because there's, there's not a permanent shelter here. So we count on churches and other spaces that are able to lend us uh, their, their space and their resources for two weeks, three weeks. Um, so we moved five, five times. Uh, right now, fortunately, we do have a semi-permanent space until the end of this year, until December of 2019, um, that we will be moving into uh, this uh, next month. But, um, and so far in the last, uh, in the first three months um, that the shelter has been in place, um, and the shelter is only for uh, family units, and um, it can be both parents and children. It can be a single parent and a children and, and a child. Or we also do taking uh, pregnant single uh, females that border patrol or ICE released from their custody. Um, we have uh, more than 8,000 um, people have gone through a shelter uh, since uh, October 26, uh, 2018, until three days ago. And the shelter also, it's really hard to try to manage uh, resources and volunteers and staff that we have. Uh, numbers really vary. There's no way that we can predict uh, how many folks we're getting. Uh, when we started, as I mentioned, uh, immigration agencies were just releasing them on the street. After a few weeks of um, meetings and advocacy with immigration agencies, we were able to create um, a collaboration. So currently, they'll call us and let us know how many uh, people they're gonna release that day and if we have capacity. The shelter right now has capacity for 97 people, uh, but on a single day, uh, immigration has released 189 folks from custody. So we had to open two overflow space uh, with a couple of hours notice um, just last week. And since last week, we've gotten over 100 folks um, every day. For example, Monday, we, we got 102, Tuesday we got 98, and today we're getting 125 um, to the shelter. Um, we provide basic uh, medical services. A lot, of, uh, a lot of folks have been in Border Patrol custody for three to five days, um, so they're dehydrated, um, they haven't had a proper meal um, in, the, in, in a long period of time. Um, kids sometimes have a cough or are sick because of the cold, uh, extreme cold that they, they experience at the Border Patrol stations, the, the, the famosas um, yeleras or ice boxes, um, and a lot of complaints overall about the conditions uh, when they are in Border Patrol custody. Um, so once they come into the shelter, what we do is um, we have the county, and they'll do a basic um, medical screening for them, and then we'll do intake and registration and make sure they're able to connect with their family members. Uh, we help them arrange all of their travel and everything that they need to go to their sponsor in the US. If they don't have one, then Jewish Family Services will um, handle their case and their resettlement if they're gonna stay in San Diego. Uh, most of the people um, stay between 12 and 48 hours at the shelter. Uh, we do make it a priority to try to move people to their final destination as, fa as fast as we can because um, we need to make space for the next group for the, for the next day. Um, so we have, um, so they stay between 12 and 48 hours after that. Uh, if they're traveling by bus, most of them aren't staying in San Diego. 99% of them are traveling outside of San Diego and most of them outside of California. Um, so they're gonna be traveling by bus um, three to four days. So we do prepare snap bags, diapers, and everything that they're, they're gonna need because they don't, they don't have any money for their journey. And if we have money, then we'll give them to them, uh, some, some money for them for their, for their travel, but not, we, don't, we don't have that option um, every day or for every single family um, that is traveling on, on that day. Um, and after that, um, right now we also partner, we have a partnership with Casa Cornelia. Uh, when we move to the new uh, facility next month, um, they're gonna start doing um, legal orientation so that people understand their situation in the U.S. Sometimes they think just because they're in the U.S. they already have status or they were already granted asylum. Um, so we need to make them clear. Uh, they, they need to know what their status is in the U.S., that they don't have a work permit um, and, and other important information. We also explain to them. So they're given two documents when they leave, which is in English. And as I mentioned, some of the families don't even speak Spanish. Um, so we try to explain the importance of 
presenting to their ALS check-in in their final destination, and then they're given an NTA, which is a notice to appear, which is technically a court date, uh, but we know it's gonna be a fake one. Um, all the folks that were released um, last fall, they had the same court date no matter where they went. They had a, as a court date uh, January 31st, and a lot of them have to travel three to four hours to get to the court, um, and they showed up and they, were, they weren't scheduled so they just have to keep calling the hotline and figure out when they're gonna get um, their court date. Um, so there are a lot of challenges. A lot of them are traveling to other states where uh, they don't have the same resources that they do here in California with a lot of immigration attorneys or nonprofits that can provide uh, assessments. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, right now one of our um, uh, right now, we're, we already have an, a space for the rest of the year, so we're really excited about that. We were able to get some um, funding. Our executive team from the, for, for the rapid response has been outstanding and has done a lot of fundraising and everything so that we can continue um, serving the families at least uh, till the end of the year. Um, but that, that is what we have been doing. That's, that has been the, the San Diego humanitarian response to this um, crisis uh, at the border. Um, so we're really happy to be able to uh, share with you the work. And if you're interested in volunteering or donating, um, we Leah will have um, Leah will have information for you and any questions that you have about the shelter and the families and the changes the changes um, in recent uh, border policies. Um, I'm eager to answer your questions at the end. Um, yeah, people are going to start going around to take cards from if you've got your questions already. And, um, well, let me just move on. <laughs> um, Enri Enrique Morones is our next speaker. He's a human rights activist born in San Diego to Mexican parents. Um, oh, and can you also, if you haven't already uh, quieted your... Um, your cell phone, please do that. Um, so he's born to Mexican parents who instilled in him a deep love for Mexico, spiritual faith, and social justice. He is driven by the passage, for I was hungry and you gave me food, I was thirsty and you gave me drink. Enrique has a history of firsts. In 1998, he was the first person to be granted dual citizenship with Mexico the first president of the San Diego County Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the vice president uh, in Major League Sports with the San Diego Padres, bringing the first ever regular season games outside of the United States and Canada. He pre was the president and founder of the House of Mexico and president and founder of the Border, Agents, Border Angels, an all-volunteer group. Enrique has been featured on NBC, CNN, CBS, BBC, NPR, Univis Univision's Don Francisco Presente, and I'm going to skip, <laughs> I'm going to murder all the, uh, the Spanish um, organizations, in countless other international media around the world. He frequently lectures and has more than held his own on shows with Bill, Bill O'Reilly and Lou Dobbs. He promotes the truth about the migrant community. As a founder of Gente Unida, a United States, a United, a human rights border coalition, he has led the national effort against the uh, vigilante Minutemen, soundly shutting them down in California. He is recognized as one of the 100 most influential Latinos in the USA by Hispanic Business Magazine, and his recognitions include being Frontline Human Rights International Awardee for his lifelong dedication to human rights, a 2009 National Human Rights Award presented by Mexican President Felipe Calderon, 2010 California Spirit Award and, uh, by Gil, presented by Gil, Gil Cedillo, Cedillo, and Bishop Buddy Alumni Award presented by USD, University of San Diego. So please welcome Enrique Morales. Uh, 
Well, thank you very much. I'm glad to be back here with the uh, League of Women Voters, and congratulations on, on all your work. I know you're approaching 100 years, so uh, congratulations. Fantastic. So as mentioned, my name is Enrique Morones, and uh, I see a lot of familiar faces out there. And it's important, more important than ever to be heard, to not be quiet, to be outraged, to pay attention. Because what is taking place right now, our children are watching. And a society is judged on how we treat our children. And we should be ashamed of ourselves as a people to have allowed what's happening right now to happen. And that's why I'm glad there's organizations like the League of Women Voters. Like the League of Women Voters that have been so active in, in promoting uh, right, the rights of women and, and individuals. So the Border Angels is, uh, has been around since 1986. And when I started the organization, there was no wall. What happened was, I was born in San Diego, very proud to be 100% Mexican, born here. And a friend of mine from another great country, because there's 200 great countries in the world. No country is greater. There's 200 great countries. And she's from El Salvador, and she says, Enrique, oftentimes you're collecting things, and she means like uh, you know, food and clothing, things like that. How come you don't help us out where we live? And, and I said, where do you live? And she said, Carlsbad. And I go, Carlsbad? That's a wealthy area. I live in Golden Hill. And she said, yeah, but in Carlsbad, where I live, there's people that live in the canyons. So that's how Border Rangers got started. I started going up to the canyons in North County, and there was people living there, there still is, and they work in the fields, the strawberry fields, the flower fields, etc. And I couldn't believe that the most powerful economy in the world allowed people to live in this situation. So I started going up there to bring food and so forth, and then other people started doing it, and that's how we got started. About 10 years later, in 1996, when I was with the Padres, we started going out, myself and a couple of people, to put water in the desert. Because what happened was, in 1994, after uh, Ronald Reagan had said, a decade and a half or two decades earlier, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Well, in 1994, the United States built their own wall. That wall that covers a third of the U.S.-Mexican border. The U.S.-Mexican border is 2,000 miles. 700 miles has a wall. And the last 55 miles of what was approved in 2006 was just granted by Congress. So there's no new wall. That's just completing the 700-mile agreement that had been done uh, bipartisan-wise uh, a few years back. But anyways, that wall of, uh, of 1994 has led to the death of more than 11,000 human beings. There's debating numbers. But whether it's 8,000, 11,000, or one, it's people that shouldn't be dying. Uh, Dr. Mead gave a couple of examples of stories because it's very important to personalize this issue. There's 11,000 people that have died. And I can almost guarantee that in this audience, uh, there's probably nobody that can give me the name of, maybe there is, but three of the 11,000 that have died. Maybe not even one. Let me give you the name of a couple. Marco Antonio Villasenor. Marco Antonio Villasenor crossed the desert, crossed the border, for the number one reason people cross borders all over the world. The father wanted to find work to feed his family, and he brought his son with him. Currently, there's 250 million undocumented people in the world. Most don't live in the United States or have any interest to live in the United States. There's 250 million in the world. So Marco Antonio's father crosses with his son, and as they cross, the son becomes very thirsty. So the, father asks the, 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 the son asks the father for some water, and his father won't give him any water. So he asked the next man, and the next man, and the he asked 18 men. Neither of the 18 men would give the five-year-old boy water. And why not? They were already dead. And Marco Antonio Villasenor also died. 19 human beings perish. This happened on the border, on the Texas side of the border. People are dying. People are dying every day. And we need to do something about it. But it's not just men, it's also women. The number two reason people cross is family reunification. Many of you are in this situation. Maybe it was a couple of hundred years ago. Somebody comes first and then the rest of the family. Lucrecia Dominguez wanted to be with her husband who was living in the United States. So she hires a smuggler, a coyote, a pollero. And he says, I'm crossing a group tomorrow, but don't bring those two little kids with you because the kids will slow us down. So the next day she shows up to meet with the smuggler. Of course she brought her two children. Her whole purpose was family reunification. So he gets mad, charges extra, and they start crossing. And as they cross, the cho children do slow them down. So the smuggler says, I told you not to bring them. You're on your own. 
and he leaves Lucrecia with her two children. And Lucrecia Dominguez literally dies in the arms of Jesus, her 15-year-old son, Jesus. This is what's happening right now. And a society is judged on how we treat our children. Last year was the deadliest year of people crossing borders around the world. About 8,000 people died. On the U.S.-Mexican border, it was around 300. The people crossing from Africa and from the Middle East to Europe was more than 6,000. 300 could die in one instance. The ferry boat tips over in the Mediterranean, and you have that little boy, Ailan Kuri, in the red t-shirt, face down. You remember that image? They die, 300 people die in one day. These people should not be dying. And these people that are risking their lives crossing borders, for the most part, have no legal way of entering. So when people give you that rhetoric, get in line, I've already talked about how some people that are trying to get in line, because some actually have a possibility, they're being blocked from being able to do it. But for the most part, people do not qualify for visas, so they risk their lives. We, the Mexicans, for several decades, were the largest group of people crossing without papers into the United States. Several decades. And even in our peak, it was a very small percentage of the population of Mexico. Because a lot of times people say, why is everybody leaving? I go, most aren't. My whole family lives in Mexico. It has a desire not to live anywhere else, just like most Mexicans. But we are no longer the largest group of people crossing without papers. Now it's the Central Americans, and it's a different situation like I have mentioned. But before it was the Central Americans, and before it was us, the Mexicans, it was many of you. At one time, it was the Irish that were the largest group, or the Germans, or the Italians. And when it was those groups, there was really no illegal way to come because they just kind of checked in. It wasn't like there was an illegal way. So when they said, we came legally, I say, how else could you have come? And the people that are coming today, you know, I say, for the most part, there's no legal way to come. We should treat people in a humane manner. The United States is one of 200 great countries, and no country is more responsible for people leaving their homeland than the United States and the home country where they're leaving from. Because the U.S. policies in other countries, I thought about Reagan, when he interfered in Central American policies, it causes people to flee. All of a sudden you have these gangs that, started, that, you know, that didn't exist, starting in Los Angeles, the MS-13. These were people that were forced to leave El Salvador, and now they start these gangs. So the U.S. has a great responsibility in that, planting the seeds of this unrest, whether it's in Central America, Mexico. When President Bush invaded Iraq, a million and a half Iraqis were forced to flee. 600,000 Iraqis died. The United States is 21st in the world in welcoming migrants. It should be number one when you do it per capita, when you do it per capita. So we need to realize this, and you have that, that individual right now, that because of his words of hate and his actions of hate, the Southern Poverty Law Center just came out with a study saying that right now we're at an all-time high in hate crimes against women, against Mexicans, against Muslims, against the gay community, etc. We all know that story. Just like the League of Women Voters that has record numbers of, of uh, membership right now, all of our organizations are in that same situation. We have record numbers of membership. When we started putting water out in the desert in 1994, we would have 30 or 40 volunteers. In 1996, we'd have 30 or 40 volunteers. Now when we go out and put water, that third Saturday in November of 2016, we had 500 volunteers. We've limited it, it's too much. It's too much to have 500 volunteers. But because of what's happening, people are outraged, paying attention and taking action. The woman that came up with that saying is Heather Heyer. Heather Heyer was the woman that was killed in North Virginia, that Trump called some good people over there. She said, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. So the Border Rangers were a nonprofit, nonpartisan group. Every week we have different activities. People say, what's a regular day? We don't have a regular day, just like these organizations. But I'll tell you just about this this week. On Monday, we did a big thing with the oral history down at Balboa Park to talk about some of the actions and things that we've done. On Tuesdays, we have immigration attorneys that offer free advice our, at our office, like some of these other organizations. On Wednesday, today, right now, we have about 50 students right now in Holtville. It's in your brochure. In the brochure you have, there's a cemetery where hundreds of unidentified migrants are buried. They're out there right now, right now. It's a school, mainly the, the students are from Mount um, St. Mary's in Los Angeles, an all-women's college. They're out there right now with some of our people putting crosses and saying prayers. Maybe in two weeks we'll do the same thing with the Hillel chapter from Baltimore, where in the Jewish tradition we'll put stones. Maybe in another two weeks we'll go out there and release butterflies. We're not a religious group, we're a faith-based group. 
On Thursday, tomorrow, we do day labor outreach. We go visit the mostly men that stand in front of the Home Depots looking for work, and we bring them uh, donations. On Fridays, we have a podcast. We have a podcast, and it's called Bad Hombre. He said, and you know who he is, unfortunately, he said Bad Hombre. And I go, no, 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 it's Bad Hombre. So we have a podcast, and it's every, uh, every, we tape it on Fridays, but it's on Monday. So it's called Bad Hombre. So my partner goes, hey, how about me? And I go, okay. So we also have not only Bad Hombre, we also have Bad Mujer. We also have Bad Mujer. <laughs> so for us, it's very important that we practice what we preach. In equality in all aspects. This Friday at our shelter, because we also have a shelter. We have a shelter in Tijuana. It's the closest building to the wall on Playas de Tijuana. We have a capacity for 50 people. And we have people there right now. Just two weeks ago, we had the star of Roma. She stayed there for four days because she was doing some photo shoots at the wall. And then about two weeks before that, a lot of people from Hollywood come down and, and, and want to spend time with us. So this group comes down, they go, we want to go down and, and bring some uh, donations to the shelter. We have a VIP coming in the car and all this kind of stuff. And I go, well, who is it? And they go, Dwayne Johnson. I go, Dwayne Johnson, you mean The Rock? And they go, yes. So I tell our people in Tijuana and they go, La Roca? And I go, yeah. So, so we have a, you know, a lot of people, because people want to be on the right side of justice. We also have a, a, a program which is called Gimme Shelter. Because the San Diego Response Network, what they do is fantastic. But sometimes we have single individuals that want to come, or we have people that show up at our office. So we have a program, Gimme Shelter, where we have individuals that have taken in moms with kids. We had somebody the other day where the baby had been born in the U.S. The baby was only nine days old. That was about two months ago. We have a couple of cases right now that we have. So we have a program called Gimme Shelter. One of the things that's important to, uh, to also note, on the cover of the brochure there, you see a little girl trying to talk to her dad. Her dad's on the Mexican side of the border. She's on the U.S. She's not even on the ground. She's so little, she's barely holding on to the wall. They can't even shake hands. So we started a program in 2013 where we opened the door of hope and children hugged their deported parents. Well, we have the worst Border Patrol chief that we've had in the last 20 years, I would say, right now, Rodney Scott. He shut down that door opening. He even shut down Friendship Park for a while. He even has agents tear gassing women and children. This administration started by dehumanizing people. Then they started taking the children away from their parents. Then they started putting those children in cages. Now they're tear gassing children. And in December of this past year, two children, a seven-year-old and an eight-year-old, Felipe and, and Jacqueline, died in Border Patrol custody. A seven and an eight-year-old Guatemalan child. That's what's happening right now. We need to be outraged. We need to speak out. In, in, 2000, in, in the election of 2016, 63 million people voted for Hillary. 60 million voted for Trump. 100 million didn't vote. That was the problem. 100 million didn't vote. We can never allow that to happen again, ever. Our children are watching. It's very, very important that we speak out. On, Sunday, on Saturdays, we have something called Caravans of Love. We have this, all these cars that go down to Tijuana and bring donations to the various shelters. We work directly with 10 of the shelters. And on the first Sunday of the month, we have a program where we have immigration attorneys that offer free advice, like we do every Tuesday. Leah was one of those immigration attorneys for a couple of years that would do that. So we do that on Sundays, and we do that on the Mexican side of the border. So join us, support us. We have a lot of programs. It's important that we all participate. Um, there's a lot more, but we only had a, you know, 10 minutes each and so forth. But I really appreciate the fact that you're allowing us to come here and to speak. I know there's going to be questions after all four of us are speaking. But the most important message I always give people is that love is an action. It's not just a word. So, so join us. Join the various organizations. We could all use your help. We're, we're nonprofits. And I would be remiss in, if I didn't mention that. I'm really excited to see that uh, the new president of the Chicano Federation is with us today. The Chicano Federation is a social justice organization that's been around for a long time. They had this gentleman who's he's been a great leader, Ray Uceta. He's had health issues and so forth. And there was an interim director there. And a lot of us were saying, she's the perfect person. She is the perfect person. Why are you doing a national search? So they said, you know, because of several of us, we're going to hire that person. And she's right over there. Her name is Nancy Maldonado. <laughs> Nancy, why don't you stand up and be recognized? <laughs> That's what it's all about. So don't forget, Border Angels. And we have a big campaign right now that says, love always wins. Resist with pride. 
So we have these t-shirts for $20. But because you're with the League of Women Voters, only because of, because of that, two for 40. Two for 40, <laughs> it's a special. Thank you, muchas gracias. Get the lump out of my throat here. All right, um, so our next speaker is um, Leah Shavaria, is the Senior Associate Attorney for the Jewish Family Service in San Diego, California, where on a pro bono basis, she helps newcomers and non-citizens defend against their removal from the United States before the immigration courts, courts of appeal, the Board of Immigration Appeals, and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. She also sits as the treasurer on the executive committee for the American Immigration Lawyers Association. She's presented at the 2016 and 2017 um, AILA Annual Conference on Waivers, the 2017 California Chapters Conference on New State Laws, and frequently presents to local law schools and other groups regarding current immigration issues and the practice of immigration law. She is also a local advocate for the immigration life, for immigrant rights and served on the 2017 advisory board for the San Diego Immigrant Rights Consortium. As a new mom to an energetic baby girl, um, Ms. Shabaria's advocacy efforts have risen to a new level because now more than ever, she hopes her daughter will get to see a world where all human rights are not just respected, but cherished. Welcome, Leo. Wow, uh, what distinguished presenters I am to follow here today. Uh, thank you everyone for having us, and thank you for having me to speak. Um, I want to make a first public apology to Enrique Morones for having to stop volunteering for Border Angels because I became a mom. Um, and, and then now once I returned to work after having my daughter, I entered the pro bono community. And of course, my time is very limited. So I'm here speaking to you today from Jewish Family Services. We're an organization that has been around for 100 years, um, like, like you all. Um, I work in the Immigration Services Department. We provide removal defense relief for those who are seeking defense to their removal uh, in the United States. And we also provide affirmative relief for uh, immigrants who are applying for benefits to stay in the United States. That would be legal permanent residency or citizenship, something like that. Um, I want to start today by asking a question. Does anybody know the difference between an asylee and a refugee? I see a few hands, so I'm thinking maybe there's some confusion there, so I want to clear that up very quickly. Um, it's an important point because Ev was talking, Mr. Mead was talking about a lot of asylees coming to the United States. A refugee is someone who applies for refugee status from outside of the United States. They essentially enter into a line to have their number called to go to, to be placed in a country that will accept them as a refugee. They do have to make, meet the definition of a refugee, which is the same definition that an asylee has to meet, and I'll give that in a moment. So an asylee is someone who is not counted in those numbers and leaves their country because of persecution or is already in the United States and decides that they cannot return home because of persecution and they avail themselves to the U.S. system of law saying, please protect me here in this country while I am here now, or they come to the border and find an agent as uh, of me. Uh, explained, they find an agent and say, please protect me, do not allow me to return home. So that's the number one difference. Um, refugees in the United States has been limited. We formerly allowed a lot more refugees in the United States. Now we only have a max limit of 30,000 refugees. Uh, in 2017, we placed only 33,000 refugees. And if you remember, under the Obama administration, he upped the ante so that we could allow for 55,000 refugees a year. But uh, that was limited by the current administration. 
So uh, our organization works to also help refugees resettle. So a lot of our affirmative work is helping those refugees resettle. So a refugee is someone, uh, a refugee or an asylee is someone who has to meet the definition of refugee according to the UN uh, protocol. And that is someone who has a fear of persecution or has uh, been persecuted in the past based on their religion, their race, their membership in a particular social group, their political opinions. There's five grounds that they have to prove. And then they also have to prove that the government has persecuted them directly or that they, the government is unable or unwilling to protect the individual. So it's a very high standard that uh, these individuals have to prove that they should not be returned to their country. So that's first and foremost just something, some ground uh, uh, foundational information I wanted to give you. Now, Jewish Family Services is also a part of the Rapid Response Network, and uh, as uh, me, as we call her, uh, introduced you to what the Rapid Response Network is. I just wanted to um, mention a couple things there. Um, Jewish Family Services is a core legal partner for the Rapid Response Network and in that we provide legal services to individuals who the Rapid Response Network encounters. One of those um, situations is if there is a what Esme was describing as a raid where ICE agents will come into the United or come into an organization and begin arresting individuals. So yes, many times those raids are not actual raids, but sometimes they are. And recently, actually a few days ago, there was a raid on Zion Market here in San Diego and a number of individuals there were arrested. So we have uh, at Jewish Family Services provided legal consultation to over 20 individuals who were affected by that, by that ICE raid. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's one thing that we're doing. Some of those families, many of those families qualify for relief. Some of them qualify for asylum, again, because they're in the United States and they uh, have a fear of returning to their home so they can request asylum and that is a legal ground that they can, um, that they can apply for. And then another thing I wanted to mention is the shelter that we're working with uh, uh, in the Rapid Response Network, the shelter. I wanted to mention just a couple stories of individuals that we've come across in the shelters. One is a mother who was in active labor when she was released to the shelter. So if you can imagine, the family units that are being released, they're released in any state of health condition, and one of them is they could even be in active labor. So one of these women, we helped uh, get to the hospital, and she delivered her baby within a matter of hours after being released to the shelter. Another woman was dropped off and she had a two-day-old baby. Uh, so this baby was born when she was uh, in ICE custody. So um, while we're talking about stories, I just wanted to also talk about some of the asylum case examples that we see in our work. So I can't go into the same details as I've made because I'm protected by attorney-client privilege. So any of you who are attorneys in the room know that we have to be very careful with the stories that we share about our clients. But I will say that many of our cases are LGBT cases. They come from Honduras, Brazil, Nicaragua, Cuba. These are a few cases that we've won within the last few weeks, uh, that we won their case for asylum before an immigration judge, where a judge determined that this individual met the definition of an asylee. We have religious cases from Azerbaijan, we have um, vari variations of Muslim women who uh, are requesting asylum, political activism, former military members. These come from countries all over the world. Uh, mental illness cases where they, re they receive asylum because they have a mental illness and if they are returned to their country, for example, Mexico, there's documented abuses if they uh, return and then seek uh, help for their mental illness, they could be um, incarcerated and then tortured because of their mental condition. We also have uh, wrong place at the wrong time individuals who end up in political issues and, uh, and then they're in the wrong place in the wrong time and their entire family is attacked. I can speak to one family who, uh, the, this was the scenario and the, the wife was raped when soldiers came to their home looking for her husband and the entire family had to flee with their six children coming to the United States. 
um, this family lost their asylum claim because the immigration judge said that their travel to the United States took too long. So because this Congolese family traveled through multiple countries to get to the United States and the pregnant mother, who was five months pregnant when she was first raped by soldiers in her own country, get, delivered birth on their, on their way to the United States in Costa Rica. And they had to stay in Costa Rica for three months because she, was, uh, because she needed medical care for the delivery of her child. So the asylum judge said, why didn't you ask for asylum while you were in Costa Rica? You should have stayed in Costa Rica. Of course, Costa Rica uh, could, not hold, could not give them asylum. And if they could, they could face other dangers in that country as well. So they did not stay in that country. And they, they of course, wanted to come to the United States. They made it all the way here. They crossed the border, fought their claim, and it was ultimately denied. So. Um, I want to also touch real quickly on some of the biggest challenges and then I want to stop talking so that you all can have some time for some questions because I think we're nearing the end of today. But some of the biggest challenges that we have is credibility. So when individuals come to the U.S. border, they are processed by uh, CBP agents and they're there, they have to give a statement of why they're asking for asylum. In those statements, they are um, recorded by the CBP officers and oftentimes it's a very quick, maybe 20, 30 minute in, uh, interview. So those statements frequently are used against individuals when they're in immigration court to say, well, you said this at the border about your asylum claim and today you are saying not that you were detained for two days, but you were detained for three days, so therefore I find you uncredible or incredible. So very small discrepancies like that are used in the immigration court system to delineate individuals' uh, asylum claims so that judges who are right now under quota to deny a certain number of cases can meet that quota. So a discrepancy as little as one or two or three days can make an asylum claim today. It's very sad. Another biggest challenge is access to counsel. So as, um, as Avmeed stated, uh, there are many individuals who, um, who he's working with to fight their asylum claim, but there are many, many more who do not have any access to counsel. So Jewish Family Services, our goal is to focus on providing legal counsel for those who are the most vulnerable. Um, so that's anybody who has no community support, anybody who has uh, no financial support whatsoever. So with that, we recruit a lot of volunteers to help us because my team that goes into court right now is a team of four people. If you can imagine, we can't represent very many people if there's only four of us. So we recruit volunteer attorneys. So if anybody is a volunteer and wants to take on cases, you can definitely speak with me. I know that all of the organizations here rely on volunteers as well. And you can definitely reach out to any of us for any volunteer opportunities. Um, let's see. The last thing that I wanted to make note of is the uh, migrant protection policy. So as, uh, as me explained, there are changing policies quite frequently, and we then have to change the way that we do things. So right now, there's a policy called the migrant protection policy. It's also known as remain in Mexico policy. So this is a very unfortunate policy that just started that uh, the administration is keeping individuals in Mexico while they fight their asylum claims. So these individuals travel for thousands of miles sometimes and then finally make it to the U.S. border, ask for asylum, expect for their case to be heard and instead are told, nope, you're going to wait in Mexico while uh, you have your claim. The pro there are a number of problems with this. The first is Mexico doesn't have the system set up to house these individuals. It's not a formal process. So there are local agencies in uh, Tijuana, for example, who have set up shelters and individuals oftentimes have to rely on staying in those shelters. But as we know with our own shelter experience is that bed space is limited. So the more folks that come to the border and ask for asylum and are then told that they have to remain in Mexico for their claim, they will most likely um, abandon their claim. We already know of three families who did abandon their claim because they had nowhere to live while they waited for their court hearing in March. 
So another problem is access to counsel, like I mentioned. So we are right now in our or agency trying to coordinate how we are going to spend time in Tijuana to prepare legal defenses for these individuals while they uh, wait for their court hearings. Another issue is, are we allowed to practice law while we're in Mexico? Because that's essentially what we'll be doing. So that's just a few of the issues uh, regarding that policy. There are many, many more. But I think um, right now I want to yield any time that I have for questions. And of course, anybody can reach out to me personally if you want more information on the work that we do or how to help um, the, the vulnerable clients that we serve. I have cards with me if anybody wants to reach out. Thank you. All right, we have collected a lot of questions. Um, obviously, I'm not going to be able to get to everyone's question, but I've kind of aggregated them and tried to get the ones that have been asked the most up first. And I think some of the ones that have been asked most, um, thanks, Jeannie, have re regarded what um, we as attendees and concerned citizens can do to help each of your organizations become more successful in helping um, immigrants. So if each of you could just take a minute, well, I'll just pass the mic down. We are going to, we have this room until um, a little bit later and our panelists agreed to stay until about 1.40, so we have a few extra minutes to answer questions. So um, thank you to the panelists who agreed to spend a little bit more time with us. So if you could just take the mic and pass it down and tell us how we can help. That would be helpful. Um, well, obviously, donate, uh, volunteer, uh, but also just make sure you're informed about the issues, make sure you have the correct information, most up-to-date information, um, because some of our, the challenges that we have is constantly trying to um, trying to tell the truth about what's happening. As, as Ev mentioned, like, uh, asylum seekers don't have a script. Uh, we've seen it at the shelter. Um, Ev has seen it in his experience. So it's really important that every time that we have the opportunity to talk about issues that we care about, whether it's immigration or other issues, to have correct information and be able to point um, folks to um, trustworthy organizations and people who are actually doing um, the work and um, are familiar with what's going on. What is your website? Uh, it's um, aclusandiego.org. Great. No, very, very much to echo what Esmeralda said. Uh, let me just say with us, there, there are really two ways you can help. Um, one is it, to do one of the asylum cases that, where I serve as an expert witness. We'll do a 100-page study. Um, and I have student researchers who support that. Um, it costs to support a student researcher, let's say, for the summer, it costs about $1,500. With that, we can probably do three cases. Um, three people sounds like small, uh, when, if you think about the numbers that we're talking about, in tens and hundreds of thousands. But we can make a real difference in those cases. And I'd be happy if anyone is interested in pulling together as a group to sponsor a student. Members of the league have done that in the past, and that would be fantastic. If you're looking for a, a, another option, um, the other thing you can do is take our summer certificate program. We do it, um, it's called the Transborder Opportunities Certificate. We have a, a, a graduate right here. <laughs> um, and Enrique has come and, and spoken to, to us. And what we do is we, we, we take five or six big themes about the border and bring in experts to talk. It's a fun, fantastic course and the proceeds from the course support our work. So if you're interested in that, if you just Google Transborder Opportunities Certificate, um, that will route you directly to me and we can talk about that. We'd, we'd also be happy to, if you guys want to come, if a handful of you wanted to come as representatives of the league, we could probably give you a discount. Your website? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, sandiego.edu uh, forward slash transborder institute. Uh, let me just emphasize quickly the work that Abu does. Uh, his work can help us make precedential decisions that can change the course of asylum law. So I would say absolutely, please help him in these endeavors. Um, of course, for my own organization, yes, we want volunteers as well. If anyone is an attorney and looks to uh, wants to take a pro bono case, we can help train you, we mentor you, walk you through the process, um, and you could... Uh, 
we have a long list of uh, individuals who are looking for legal representation and you can actually review case digests and pick a case out of the digest. Uh, once you go through our pro bono volunteer um, training. We also take volunteers for any other number of reasons, even if it's not immigration related. Jewish Family Services has a large volunteer network for many different things, even administrative uh, volunteering in the immigration services program or other programs. And um, also there's cards on your tables uh, with and a flyer on your tables with information about how to support the shelter, the migrant shelter as well as uh, donation envelopes if you want to make a donation today. We'd be happy to accept that as well. Thank you. Pretty much the same thing. We're all looking for volunteers. We're all looking for support. Like I mentioned, we have the t-shirts and all that type of stuff, books. This helps us with our expenses. We're a 501c3. We rent a little office in Sherman Heights. We have a lot of people that are involved with Border Angels in the audience. Rosalie has been involved with us for a long time. And Judge Octavio here was a board member of the Border Angels. Haley is involved in our Gibby Shelter program. So there's plenty of us out here. Carlos, a new member, he's out there someplace. Um, and it's important that you participate. So we all need help, we all need support. I don't know about them, but I'm gonna be sticking around a little longer. I'll just be at the table when we're done with the, the question. So thank you. Thank you. Um, another question we've gotten multiple times from our audience pertains to the children who've been separated or separated months and months ago, what their status is, where they are, and what the progress is on getting them back together with their parents. Mm -hmm. Whoever wants to take that. I have some of that. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So the ACLU um, with other partners, we had the lawsuit last year. Uh, most of those families were able to be reunited. I think about a little less than 100 um, are still waiting. Uh, there are some concerns according to the government on um, whether or not the parents are fit um, to take care of the children. Uh, but as you know, in recent um, days, there was the news that um, more children, even that the original number that we thought were separated. So our, uh, legal nas our national office legal team was actually here in San Diego last week. Um, to try to get those families um, to be part of our lawsuit so they're protected and that the government has to also, um, and that the judge orders hopefully to the government to uh, reunite those families. So we are just waiting um, on the San Diego court to um, decide on that. Anybody else want to add to that? How many are there? Uh, do you know the actual number? Yeah, I don't have the actual number as well, and I think that the number changes uh, a bit as well. And I don't think the, the number that's publicized is accurate either. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I could just, I wanted to, on a personal note, say there was one family that we represented, and mother and daughter were finally reunited, but that was only after mother accepted her deportation. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, another question we've gotten multiple times is regards the... Um, America's actions in these countries that are now sending um, their refugees and asylum seekers. What, can you give us a little bit of background on what happened and some of the actions that America has taken that has kind of resulted in this um, immigration? Yeah. yeah, that's a good one for me. Um, yeah, so what, what I would say is that this one's complicated because it's not one thing in one place. It's multiple things in multiple places and it has historical layers to it. Let me just give you a, the, the, the short, the quickest version. The quickest version is that uh, during the civil wars in Central America, which began as sort of low intensity conflicts in the 1960s, 1966 in Guatemala is usually the first date that we give, and then really intensified by 1979 or 1980 into full-blown civil wars where the civilian population was squeezed between um, a revolutionary uprising and a dictatorial military government. The United States, um, under the Reagan administration, we sided with the dictators. It's just a historical fact at this point. And um, there was an, there's another piece of that, though, and it's, that, that's important, and that's that most of the folks who fled a significant portion of the entire population of El Salvador, for example, about one in five Salvadorans fled at some point during the Civil War. Many ended up here, but very few were, uh, were able to win asylum 
or, or other kinds of immigration relief in the United States. And the failure to recognize that first generation of refugees um, is directly related to what's going on right now. These are the children and grandchildren of that first generation. So what happened to them? They lived a precarious life in the United States. They're in the aftermath of the Civil Wars. The, 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 two, the Civil Wars ended in El Salvador in 1992 and Guatemala in 1996. There was no rebuild. There was no Marshall Plan for Central America. We essentially forgot Central America. And what happened is we had a large population of people who, who, who would have met an international definition of a refugee living on in the United States. Their economies worsened, social conditions worsened, the death rate from violence was actually higher in the aftermath of the Civil Wars than it was during the Civil Wars. And there was no real coordinated U.S. response. And those places, basically you had several generations of kids who went through this pipeline of being deported and coming back and being deported and coming back and the country's becoming more and more um, dependent on the United States. The gang issue began there. Uh, and by the way, that's where it is now. So if you talk to my friend Alex Sanchez at Home Lisa Needles in, in Los Angeles, Alex came as an unaccompanied minor. Um, he just came with the previous generation of refugees. That's where the gangs came from. They were neighborhood or organizations by kids for, for whom nothing was provided. In LA, uh, this is about segregation, discrimination, um, no refugee resettlement whatsoever. And then, as they were deported, they took those gangs with them to Central America, and that began a sort of vicious cycle. And by the way, when, when these kids come to the United States, we we we're all three here, four here, we focus a lot on people who are recently crossing, but we often, like a lot of our a lot of folks in American culture, we forget about what happens once they're here. 2014, we were all in a, a, a panic about the unaccompanied minors coming here. Where are those kids now? They're in the same neighborhoods, and they're facing the same pressures and the same kind of forced recruitment into gangs as the previous generation. The gangs now are just bigger, although I would caution against the, the demonization of the MS-13, for example, much lionized in the press. If you really look at it, uh, it's impoverished teenagers. I, I don't think we need to be. They're not the Sinaloa cartel or the mafia. It's impoverished teenagers um, who have some real, real, real serious problems with other impoverished teenagers. But the idea that somehow a national security threat is ludicrous. You, you know, sure. I just want to add, look, we have a movie night every month at the Order Angel offices, and one of the ones that we recently showed that you can easily acquire is uh, Harvest of Empire. Mm. Harvest of Empire, it's a fantastic movie and it talks about this. U.S. intervention, and that movie specifically talks about U.S. intervention in the Americas. But of course it applies all over the world and we see it happening right now in Venezuela. So, Harvest of Empire, and I recommend it. There's a lot of literature, movies, and those types of things. Uh, sorry, real quick, I just wanted to mention as well, um, for refugees who come to the United States, they're enrolled in programs that help them settle in the United States. They get, a, they get employment uh, or employment services, they get cash checks until they can actually work and live on their own, they get housing. But asylees do not receive those same services. Even once they're granted asylum, they, right. they receive zero services whatsoever. <coughs> And again, both of these groups have to prove the same type of legal basis for protection. So they, uh, by and large, are the exact same group of people. The only difference is how they got here. And one group is treated with services and the other group is not. Thank you. Um, another question we got multiple times regards how our organizations, our country, our state and local government work with Mexico. This is, seems like a trans-border problem that we should try to solve together. And um, the questions would pertain to what rules or laws could be changed to make that process more seamless and allow our countries to be more productive in this problem. Take a stab at that. They're, they're, they're basically, there are two levels, and they're interesting because one gets a lot of attention, the other gets very little attention. So at the first level, um, the United States, um, really, particularly since 2014, we have basically hired Mexico as an extension of U.S. immigration enforcement. So we have dramatically reinforced with your, your tax money um, the southern border of Mexico and pushed Mexico to detain and deport Central Americans. 
And the general rule in Mexico is if you get caught south of Mexico City, you're going to be returned. If you make it north, they sort of look the other way. So that's there, uh, and it's to the tune of tens of, uh, of billions of dollars. And um, it's the, the money, the original appropriation was money that was appropriated for the drug war. It wasn't supposed to be for immigration. But that's there, and there's a lot of collaboration across law enforcement that overlaps between immigration and, and drug enforcement. On the flip side, though, and this is interesting, because this is something that the Trump administration has spearheaded, um, Mexico's new president, uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador, has announced a fund to create something like a Marshall Plan for Central America, and the Trump administration, fairly quietly, announced that the United States would help to fund it. Secretary Pompeo uh, got involved in this. I was part of a bunch of rollout meetings uh, in D.C. this fall, and um, I, I wish we, we, we could talk a lot more about that because I think Mexico's role in the immigration enforcement, frankly, has been counterproductive. It's just up to the cost and worsened the humanitarian conditions, like some of the, um, the drug enforcement measures. It hasn't really moved the needle at all, and it's come at huge human cost. But this other thing, that could be a real big deal. Uh, actually investing in Central America and reducing the pressure that people feel free to migrate, uh, that makes people migrate, but also treating people humanely when they pass through Mexico. And that piece of it, there's no incentive from the U.S. for that to happen. If anything, we've incentivized the reverse. Uh, and that, that there are specific policy measures that we could take to help Mexico guarantee the humanitarian conditions of people passing through. And let me just say one thing. The major innovation that's happened in this area didn't happen uh, because either government did it. It's the people who organize these caravans. There aren't more people coming. They're just coming in a different way. Why are they coming in a different way? Because they've been much, much safer coming that way, being very public about it and coming in a large group. I just want to add, as a Mexican, and there's a couple of us up here, I, I love Mexico, and, and the overwhelming majority of people in Mexico are fantastic, just like the overwhelming majority of people in the United States. So I think, unfortunately, sometimes it gets misrepresented, and when people talk about corruption, I say, yes, there's corruption in all 200 countries in the world, but no country has more corruption than the United States. Because I don't care what the president of Mexico does, he can't start World War III. Trump, in a tweet, could start World War III. And the way he got to where he is, is pure corruption. And we can't deny it. We can't deny it. So it's very, very sad, but it's very real. And we need to stand up to it. Whether it's here or there, we need to practice what all countries practice by majority, which is love. Love overcomes hate. Usually that person causing the hate isn't sitting in the capital of the country like is happening here. All right, our panelists have been generous with their time with us today, but we've now run over officially, and so I'd like to thank them, and please join me in thanking them.